We welcome you all to the November 1996 meeting of the Boston Main Railroad Historical Society. Uh, all three of us have been rail fans for a good many years, and I have been an employee of the, or was an employee of the Boston Main Railroad for 45 years, part and full time. How many years did you work for the Main Central, Arnold? Well, it turned out that I was born, brought up up in the White Mountains on the Mountain Division of the Main Central. And as a young fellow, uh, did a lot of uh, traveling under one form or another. They tell me that I was a riding on a steam locomotive before I could walk, which was uh, starting out pretty young. But uh, the Mountain Division and the railroads up there in the White Mountain area have always been my uh, particular interest. And I was thinking coming down tonight, some of you folks here who have seen centralized traffic control and some of the rest of the elements could hardly realize that up in the North Country, CTC was almost unheard of and that the area was what I like to call ball signal territory. Mm -hmm. Now, most of you folks are aware that there is one set of ball signals up in Whitefield, New Hampshire, the last one here in New England. And uh, the matter of fact is that that particular ball signal is not one of the original because the main central freight came down there and demolished the old original one. And they put up a set of uh, big round red balls, put a spotlight up on the side to illuminate the balls, illuminated the lanterns, and that's the ball signal that we have to put up with as being the last one in the area. But few of the members here will perhaps realize that up in that North Country, there were eight sets of ball signals in actual operation. The Main Central was the latecomer in getting up into that North Country and as such had to maintain the diamonds, the crossovers, and the ball signals. And they did with a vengeance. And there were ball signals up there located at, there were two at Fabian. Those of you who have been up here recently perhaps and tra traveled on the, on the uh, Conway Scenic, remember that Fabian Station is the last station that the railroads have come to in uh, this advancing effort to restore that piece of railroad. But there were actually two sets of ball signals controlling either the Boston Main or the Main Central trains in and out of Fabian. There was another set at Whitefield, the real set, when they were up there on a big white pole with uh, balls on both sides and red lanterns underneath them. And the reason for the, uh, for the little barrel effect down at the bottom was to hide the red lantern when it was lowered. There was a set there at Whitefield, another set at Scott's Junction. And don't let anybody tell you that the name was just Scott, because it wasn't. Boston and Maine may have chosen to call it that, but the Maine Central always called it Scott's Junction. There was a further set over in St. John's Brief until the CPR took control. There was another set of ball signals at Coas Junction and the other set at Wombeck Junction or Jefferson Junction, whichever period of time you choose to discuss. And in every case, one ball at masthead or one red light meant that the Boston and Maine trains could pass or cross. Two balls or two red lights at masthead meant that the Maine Central crossed. And there used to be several ingenious arrangements for the use of some of those ball signals, one of them at Scott's Junction. And as a little fellow, I never understood how this man who operated this thing didn't get his get into trouble. There was a winch on the station platform that controlled this cable that raised and lowered one of the ball signals to give him either Boston, Maine, or Maine Central permission to cross. This man had a long, flowing beard. And when he unwound that windlass, 
Whatever kept his whiskers from getting in that windlass and going up on the ball with the rest of it, I never did figure it. But uh, he must have done it scientifically because he never got caught, to my knowledge. And as a young fellow looking out the train, I just saw him do it quite a number of times. Those ball signals were, the, a similar arrangement was in use over at uh, Wombeck Junction. And you have to decide what period you're talking about because Jefferson Junction was the term that I used to know. That too, the ball signal was across the track from the station, quite an elaborate station there at uh, Wombeck Junction with a long platform both for the B&M and Main Central. And there again, they had this windlass arrangement that raised and lowered one of the balls to give uh, direction to the, to the trains. Mentioned a couple of the a couple of other ball signals which he didn't. Uh, just as as an aside, that there were other railroads that other than the main central up there, because there were two that I remember in the yard at Berlin, which were crossings with the Berlin Mills Railway, and also another one at uh, Zeeland Junction where the uh, Zeeland Valley Railroad came in. But that was before your time. I realize it was before <laughs> my time. But I, but I can still read timetable special instructions. Oh, yes. <laughs> they were there. Bobby, was, what protected the crossing at Masons? Automatic signals. Automatic signals in my time, at least. I don't know whether there ever was a ball signal or not. But. I don't think it was on record because the Canadian roads were rather fussy about uh, interlocking signals of that kind and insisted that they have the interlocking signals both at Mason's, which is below North Stratford, and the crossing with the Canadian Pacific at, at uh, Cookshire, which was with the Canadian Pacific, and they had automatic signals. Just above, about 12 miles further north, Quebec Central and the Main Central crossed, and they used old-fashioned ball signals. Back to Robbie. How about you, John? You got something to reminisce about? My reminisce is much more recent. Uh, back in the late 30s, up at Middlesex Engine House, basically. Well, that's all right. We uh, got to know the g gentleman up there, and uh, they were very uh, friendly and. Uh, invite you up in the cab to ride uh, and uh, even let you put in water in the tender and a few other chores like that. They wouldn't let me ride under the coal sc scuttle though. <coughs> that uh, coal bin up there was fed with a clamshell bucket from a gondola uh, hopper car and uh, a derrick to fill it. Uh, sand had the nice little doghouse up on a post with the pipe coming out. I remember riding 4011 up the, through the service area up on the table and turned around and into the house. And uh, so some of the 3200 uh, light mountains of the New Haven that came up on the Lowell Framingham. Uh, he asked me if I'd like to pull the throttle when we were down by the water uh, spout and, uh, up to the table and uh, had to reach around this way to get around him. I couldn't budge it at first, so I gave a good pull. He said, well, I didn't say run it off the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, little learn. Well, it was fun anyway, a lot of good memories. And speaking of in Middlesex Engine House, I remember railroad enthusiasts trip we had out there. I, Arnold certainly remembers uh, um, Phil Bonnet who oh. took, <laughs> took the pictures and Phil, Phil had a fetish about, he rarely took a picture of a train. Mostly he took pictures of engines, sometimes of cars, occasionally of a train or a station or something, but engines was his big thing. And he always insisted that the side rods be in low position when he took the picture. Gave the engine a, more of a balance. So we went up to Middlesex Engine House, and lo and behold, they had parked 
between the engine house and the table on one of the stall tracks, one of the Atlantics, or trailers as they were known on the B&M. And its rods, unfortunately, were in back quarter. Phil wanted to get them in low for his picture. Well, this was fine by the engine house crew. They were perfectly willing. They'd been told to do anything we asked, and they were going to make this move. It's amazing how far an 80-inch driver will, tur will go just moving a quarter of a turn. <laughs> and the hostler got up in the cab and started to move. Phil had his camera all set and everything else. And all of a sudden, somebody let out a scream and stop. The hostler dumped the air. Those tender wheels were about that far from dropping into the pit. <laughs> <laughs> so then they had to, t Phil had to take his picture right there because the table was one of those that had side girders on it. And if they lined the table up behind the engine, why it uh, was going to hide part of the engine, and Phil couldn't have that. <laughs> I have to tell you a little Phil Bonnet story, because this this one was priceless. And uh, Phil, as Robbie knows, was excitable. And he always used a big, I don't think it was a graphic camera, but it was a big uh, Somebody here that knows what it was, a big camera with a cape over the back of it, you know, why you... Stu studio camera. Okay. A French job, Arnold, with some kind of a foreign-sized film, as any of us that have his negatives can tell you. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, this was an excursion of the railroad enthusiast to Montreal. And we were invited out there afterwards, out to... Uh, what was the yard then? Tuna. Tuka. Tuka Yard. And the Canadian National Boys had lined up a whole series of locomotives for us to take pictures. Well, most of us were taking pictures with a Kodak or something like that, and it was no problem. But Phil wanted them just just so, as Donnie says, uh, rods down, everything else like that. So he gets down, gets all set up, goes under the cover, and gets up. In the meantime, there was one of those hostlers around, the French Canadian. He could speak, speak English, of course. They all could. And I said to him, you want to have some fun? Oh, sure, I'm for fun any time. What do we mean? I said, you watch me. I'm going to be behind this man with a camera. And when I give you a little motion, you back up about half the engine length. Well, we got all set, and Robbie's, uh, Phil. Phil Bonnet is about all set. He was a real Parisian Frenchman. He was not a French Canadian. But anyway, he was excitable. So when we were all ready, the hostel never looked right and left. He backed the engine up about half an engine length and stopped. Robbie comes out from under there, he's tearing his hair, takes down his tripod and everything else, and moves it down here to the location so he's going to get the picture that he thought he was going to get then. He goes under there and he's going to come out and take a look and goes under again about this time, a little of this. <laughs> the engine moves up ahead about half a length. That fella come out from under that thing, and I thought he was going to tear his hair out. He didn't have any idea where it was coming from or who was doing it. But he was sure an exasperated Frenchman. And you won't believe this, but we did it three times. And to this day, I don't know whether Phil got a picture of that old 4-6-0 or not, but he sure gave everybody else entertainment that was priceless. Did he ever wise up? <laughs> Did he? I don't think so, because he didn't know that I was standing behind him and doing it. And naturally, I didn't uh, explain to him that there was a difference in the pictures. Well, I, I, talking about Phil and that and that picture reminds me of another character that we used to have on the trips. Gerald O. Booth. <laughs> oh, saints be God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we sure did. And to, to give you an idea, it, I, I don't want to say be disparaging, but uh, Jerry was standing behind the door when they passed the brains out. <laughs> and uh, 
We went up to a, we had a trip one time that took us up to Rigby Yard. And it was still steam days. And they had an engine on the turntable for us to take pictures of. And Jerry was somewhat like Phil in having an odd size camera and so forth. And he wanted to get a picture of this particular engine full broadside. And he had his camera up there. And he kept backing up and backing up and backing up and backing up, trying to get that whole engine in the picture. And everybody saw where Jerry was headed for but Jerry. <laughs> and the next thing, there was the most god-awful splash, and he landed in the ash pit. <laughs> <laughs> But to give you sort of an idea, perhaps a better idea of the fellow, uh, I went up one time, happened to hear there was a circus train coming in off the main central. So I went up to figure I could get a couple of pictures of them coming in, and then while they were changing power at Rigby, I'd get down to uh, west of Rigby, down in, toward Old Orchard, and, and uh, get them going out again. And I arrived at PT Tower 1 and discovered that Gerald O. Boothby was up there already. Well, having had acquaintance with him, I knew what to do. As soon as I found out which track they were coming in on, because the, the main central down from, Deer, from Royal Junction was CTC by then and signaled for either direction on either track, as soon as I knew which track they were coming in on, I figured where I was going to take my picture. And of course, I wanted to shoot across the other track, at the track they were on, because it wasn't, if I got off to the side of that track, I was going to have nothing much more than a head-on picture. So Jerry, of course, we'd been talking about it. He knew what I was going to do. And when the train was getting close, I went out downstairs. I wanted to get him coming in on, as we were looking at it, the left-hand track, which meant I wanted to be over on the other side of the right-hand track. And Jerry's right behind me, and we're going up there. I figured when I was going to have to get across to the other side, and I stopped. Jerry being Jerry, he goes right by me, stops about six feet in front of me and says, I won't be in your way here, will I? I said, no, Jerry, you won't. And I went right across over there where I wanted to be in the first place and got my pictures without him in it. <laughs> but oh, there was Not a, too many of us have got Jerry Boothby's pictures in our pictures, but he sure tried in a number of cases. <laughs> I don't, I don't know whether we should be talking about people rather than events, but we had another one that I'm sure both of you remember, by the name of Father Kieran Cashin. Oh, oh my yes. stars. <laughs> yes, sir. And, uh, well, Father Choo -choo. You know, Father Choo Choo, yes, yeah. or Chooch. Well, be he, careful. I think he's still alive. He is. <laughs> he's for, he's, and, uh, but Chooch was built somewhat the same as I am. And, uh, he was assigned at one period to the mission on Arch Street back of Filene's department store there in Boston. And this was when Union Freight was running on Atlantic Avenue. And every evening after he had attended to his duties, he would go down and play and ride around on Union Freight or play brakeman or whatnot. And this was known by the superior at the mission and was perfectly all right. But one time, then they got in a new superior. And the first night that he was around, he took his evening constitutional down to Atlantic Avenue, and he thought he recognized one of the brakemen. Now, when Chooch was doing this stuff, he did not dress in clericals. He was in dungarees or whatever. But nevertheless, the superior thought he recognized this particular man, so he didn't say anything then, but the next morning he called Chooch into the office and wanted to know if he, if that was he that he'd seen down there, and yes, it was. 
And, uh, well, uh, how come? Well, Chooch, as he told me personally, he said, I'm lying in my teeth. He said, I told him that the, some of the people that worked for the railroad belonged to this parish and they couldn't get down to the regular masses because of their working hours. So they, so I was down there tending to their spiritual needs. <laughs> <laughs> well, the superior didn't really buy it. But on the other hand, he couldn't call one of his priests a liar. So he told him that uh, that was all fine and dandy, but whenever he was out on the street, he should dress so that anybody who saw him would know that he was a priest, which was fine and dandy by Chooch because the next evening, the superior went out to take his constitutional and there, in his Sunday best clericals, was Father Karen Cashin parading down Atlantic Avenue in front of the freight train with a red lantern in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> when he got back to the mission that night, the superior was waiting for him and proceeded to tell him, so I understand in layman's language, that if he must act like a goddamn fool, please don't dress so anybody would know he was a priest. <laughs> My name is Herbert Adams. I started in the White River Yard in 1946 as a yard helper, and <clears throat> I was the third highest man when I passed a conductor's exam that had ever come out of White River Junction. I felt proud of that. But of course, the very next day, that somebody went down and beat me out. <clears throat> but I got recalled into service in 1949, and I went to Korea. And I was on the railway service over there in Korea. And uh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> we had one incident where I had a, a fireman that could speak good English. And he came to me at one of the stations and says, hey, we've only got six inches of water left in the tank. And I said, we're going to have to get to the next station because there is water there. So I go down and I get the GI dispatcher on the phone and I tell him what the problem is. You know what his first question was? What do you need water for? <laughs> <laughs> so I started off on a recitation how you fill the boiler with water and you throw the coal in, you got a hell of a fire going. I just got well started and this guy butts in. and says, hey, he says, I'll tell you now, I got your train number here, so you just better go out and grab a handle, you're on your way. So I did, I went out and we went down to the next station. The guy came out at the next station and told, called my name and I went in and the guy was a major. He'd been listening in on the conversation and uh, he wanted to know where I got my train experience and so forth, and I told him all about working in the yard, White River, and so forth. I said, well, now I got a question for you. He says, what's that? I said, where'd you get your train experience? He said, oh, I was a train master on the Great Northern. <laughs> <laughs> and I says, what about this dispatcher you had that didn't know why I needed water? Oh, well, he was a radio announcer. <laughs> 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 well, we had a number of characters in White River Junction Yard, and among them is the one that was mentioned in uh, the article, I wrote a letter on this, an article that the, the guy wrote uh, about, he was a West uh, Enfield station master, station Bert, agent Bert, there. Burton Stearns. Hmm? Burton Stearns. Yeah. Well, anyways, he got the engineer's name wrong. It's not Robert Savage, it's Jim. I think he had John Mike. That huh? was in the, it was John in the manuscript, in his original manuscript. Yeah, well, it was Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I sent him a letter, see, on it, anyhow. But uh, I went with one trip on the helper with Jim. We went out through, I don't remember exactly what we had for an engine, but I think it was a K-8. We went out through to Canaan, of course, we was on the rear, and when they went through Canaan, the conductor pulled the pin on us and left us there. And we turned the engine, 
Got it all set on the main line. I go in, I get the orders from the operator to go back to West Lebanon. I come back, I give him to Jim. Jim looks at him, and I'm sitting over on the other side with the fireman by then. <coughs> Jim comes over, he says, now I'm going to tell you two bastards that you're not to say a goddamn word. You just stay right there and shut up, because I'm going back over there, I'm going to eat my lunch, and I'm going to take a nap. He went back over there and he opened the throttle. It's quite a straight, flat stretch heading south out of Canaan. He pulled the throttle on that, got her rolling real good, and he shut it off. And honest to Christ, before we got to Enfield, I could swore he was sound asleep. He did, he, he ate a sandwich and everything. But the best part about that is he never touched that throttle again until we were in West Lebanon. We drifted from Canaan all the way down through. But we pretty near stalled when we went out around Mascoma Lake. Pretty near stalled. We just barely made the pitch. And, but Jim never moved. He just, <laughs> just stood right there, just as if he was sound asleep. Probably was. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good possibility. But he woke up in, on the bridge at West Lebanon anyway, so I got off and, and backed him yeah. into the... You know, I, th I think I need something. <laughs> well, you two bladder skites, if I'd known you were going to do, I'd have brought mine, so help me. <laughs> well, if I'd known that, I'd have brought an extra one John could have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the anyway. uh, makeup of the crews on the switcher in White River Junction was nothing anybody ever heard of anywhere that I've ever talked to. The bullpen switcher on the afternoon shift down the B&M yard had a B&M Southern Division, that's New Hampshire south through to Concord, engine crew, a CV ground crew. Well, the engineer on that switcher down there was Bill Plummer. He put in a lot of years on the B&M. And one of the brakemen the CV brakeman, always arguing. Phil was sharp as a tack, and anything that uh, Frank Spaulding wanted to bring up, Bill would take the other side anyways. <laughs> One day, Spaulding got kind of sick of it and says, what are you trying to do, make a fool out of me? Bill said, perish the thought. Nature beat me to it. <laughs> Arnold, how about you? You got another? <laughs> I'll give you a chance. Sorry, Go ahead. To... Well, uh, how many of you boys here now, knowing that the 494 is up in White River Junction on display, know how it get, got there and how close it came not getting there? Perhaps this story hasn't been told in B&M circles, but no. it's, it's a B&M story and it's a good one. The railroad enthusiasts were given the locomotive 494, which was originally the 905, right. to be exhibited at the World's Fair in New York in 1939 and 40. Afterward, after the fair was over and the approaching war, the locomotive was brought back and put in the engine house in East Fitchburg under the careful observation and uh, scrutiny of Dana Goodwin, who was the railroad, the railroad enthusiast representative of the Boston and Maine Railroad in East Fitchburg. And after they decided they were going to tear down part of the engine house in East Fitchburg, where the 494 then was located, the locomotive was brought by local freight to Ayr and from Ayr to Lowell, Middlesex House, with uh, Dana Goodwin and yours truly aboard the 494, ringing the bell at every grade crossing, as you would expect. And I took a picture of it going by North Chelmsford. We were there. <laughs> well. When we finally decided where the locomotive would be located, and it took quite a lot of doing to find somebody who would accept the locomotive and put it in a place for display where it would be not only appropriate, but where it would get care. We had the assurance of the retirees up in White River Junction that they would be happy to look after it, keep it painted, and so forth, and that was the decision in, the, in White River. And uh, so the locomotive was taken into the Billerica shops. They asked the railroad enthusiasts how much money they had, and we said 500 bucks, all right? 
500 bucks to repair the 494. And every diesel locomotive that came into that shop beside that got hung for part of the charges of repairing that locomotive. <laughs> that was all right with us. When the locomotive was fully restored and ready for exhibition, it was taken out in back of the, what they used to call the firing up shed, where they had two or three of the old original four, uh, 4100s. 4114 was the engine there. And they were simply in storage. And the 494 was taken out there for a comparative picture to show the difference in the, in the steam locomotives over the passing years. The only uh, unhappy part of it was that Pat McGinnis, who had just recently been appointed president or become president of the Boston and Maine was there. And he said to Nelson Blount, who was also a witness, how would you like a locomotive for your exhibit down in Edeville? Well, of course, Nelson Blount was no chump. He said, certainly, I'd love it. Well, I'll see it sent down there. And they said, Mr. McGinnis, that's not the railroad's local. I don't give a several different kinds of hoot, gives a hoot. He said, it's on our railroad property, and I'll do with it what I want to. And he gave orders for that locomotive to be shipped to Edeville. That night, Earl Cohn, who was then assistant shop uh, superintendent, called me on the telephone at uh, work and said he didn't have much time to talk about it, but if I would give permission, this is what they were going to do. The Billwicker shop switcher, which had a train that ran from Lowell to the to Billwicker shops night and morning, would be bringing the 494 with them and stash it in, in the siding at Southwold's in North Chelmsford. That night, the uh, W uh, WC2, a Worcester to Concord freight, would pick that engine up somewhere around 2 in the morning and take it to Concord. It would be on the right side of the every other, every other day local between White River Junction and Concord. They'd pick it up that next morning and take it to White River. And they did it, in spite of McGinnis. Put it in the engine house in number one stall. Okay, this sounds like we've scored a point. And of course, eventually, uh, McGinnis said to Blount, how'd you like the engine I sent you? And the obvious answer is, what engine? <laughs> well, maybe you think the fur didn't fly. And eventually somebody had to tell where that engine was in the Westboro engine house. Get it back. All right. The boys in White River's, White River Junction's hands might have been tied, but their mouths weren't. So it just so happened that the turntable was lined for pit number one, and it came out under the coal chute, and that the Central Vermont had reciprocal switching arrangements in B&M yards. Overcame, a, overcame one of the 500 class CV switches, nosed across the table and on the 494, and took it over at the White River Engine House CV. And McGinnis uh, had a one-way ticket where he could go. <laughs> But that locomotive was put on display, and afterwards, they used the wrecker, which was kept there at that time, to uh, lower that engine down in back of the police station, where it was on exhibition for uh, a number of years. Good, I'm going to have to stop you a bit, All right. Colonel. If they didn't use the wrecker to put that engine down. They went further north, went down in at the yep. old mobile plant. Yeah. And then they brought, laid track. They Across had, Route 4. Across Route 4. Yeah. And they cribbed up going across the Route 4 over on there. But the wrecker got used as a winch to let her down. The pumpy, it well, went I up in the pumpy line. I, I was kicking around that yard when they done that, and I don't remember as the wrecker left the well, wrecker a yard. That's so. what the boys told but, us, that uh, they used it. It's very possible. It being them being them wrecker to just to let the yeah. cable out and let it down in there. Yeah. And since then, as you're probably all aware, they have moved the engine up into the area of the station. The station's been sold to private people. Yeah. And uh, it's on exhibition, and it's in good shape. And they are presently raising funds to again refurbish the engine. But I thought this story, McGinnis, of course, uh, sold off 
without anybody's permission, all the railroad passenger equipment that he possibly could. And for it, he was taken in hand by the federal government, went to uh, sentenced to Danbury Prison, and died there. That's just a matter of history. But those fellows are all gone, and the folks that arranged this uh, underhanded uh, stunt on the president of the Boston Main Railroad, he never realized or ever found out, I don't expect, how this all came about. But some of us, uh, then railroad enthusiasts, were aware of it and had a hand in it. And uh, at this restoration up here uh, just recently, I was up there and uh, had an opportunity to talk with it, and Mr. Adams was here. I'm part of that committee on the restoration of the 494. <clears throat> and there's one thing that the town didn't do. The Chamber of Commerce told those people at that time that they would put a cover over that engine. From 1957 to right now, there's never been any protection over that engine. You can imagine what the lagging is on that boiler. It's asbestos, and I imagine that's just about if you could get it, you could wring the water right out of it. And I imagine there's probably spots that, uh, on that boiler just about like that. I wouldn't want to put a fire in it. <laughs> no, jack up the whistle and build a new engine under it. <laughs> well, we have got a bad problem with the uh, tender. Because one of the, the, these were, I think they were something like 10 by 8 uh, mm -hmm. beams, oak beams in the tender. One of them completely gone. The other one is not too hot. So we got to get that tender jacked up and, and back away from the engine and repair those trucks. And that's going to be quite a job. John, you got anything <coughs> more that all of this has brought to mind? Seems to me we had a, another Phil Bonnet episode of similar to what Arnold described up at uh, White River Junction at the CV engine house. He had uh, one of the 700s off the table and uh, out where it could be photographed and <coughs> with uh, expert signals and so forth, the engine seemed to move just at the crucial time <laughs> and uh, out came a, head, a figure from under the blanket, a hat went down on the ground and he jumped up and down on the hat. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to have been a rat. <laughs> well, while we're, while we're talking about Frenchmen, of course, as a, as a uh, condition of my employment with the B&M when I went on as a, as a uh, towerman, at that time you had to learn telegraph, which I proceeded to do. And being able to understand Morse made it very interesting occasionally on fan trips. One in particular was at the 1952 NRHS National Convention, which took place in the city of Montreal. That whole weekend really was one uh, event after another. And when I say event, I say that word in quotation marks, because it uh, I, I could speak probably sit here for another half hour and tell you about it. But the one in particular was, it was a Labor Day weekend, and on Monday, we had a trip on the Montreal and Southern Counties, which was an electric line that ran north from Montreal. We had a three-car train, which consisted of a baggage express car, which was set up so that people would stand in the doorways and take pictures, two coaches, and at the Granby end of the line, the electric used the same track through the station that the Canadian National Branch to Farnham used. So we pulled in and we stopped and everybody that wanted to unloaded and we went on up about a quarter of a mile and there was a loop there for the trolleys that uh, Snake needed to have hinges to get around, but the trolleys could make it, no train ever could have. We pull in there and stop and wait, and the CN passenger train goes by. 
after which we pull back into the station because there's not going to be anything else until it's after we've gone. The station had a the had an agent on duty, even though it was a Monday a holiday, and he was in the office and had the Dutch door. The top half was open. We'd been there maybe half an hour. Up drives the police cruiser with the conductor and engineer off of this passenger train. Uh, to jump ahead just a little bit, they'd hit a hit a car on the crossing up the road a bit, and the policeman had brought him back to the station to make his report to, to the dispatcher in Montreal. And they all three of them troop into the office, and they're talking with the with the agent in French. I'm stand, he's sending his report to Montreal. I'm standing outside the door telling everybody what's going on. Well, I know looking back on it that they said, though the, the constable and the trainman said things in my direction in French, that if I had understood them, I probably would have taken a poke at somebody. I wasn't paying any attention to their French. The operator was sending his report to Montreal on the wire in English, and I was reading the Morse. I think he caught on, but the, the others never did. <laughs> Another, other times, you'd, I'd go into a station, and the, the, C, the CP and CN employees' timetables were very nice because they all, the, in the first place, the freight trains were scheduled, even though they didn't necessarily stick exactly to the schedules. and. They uh, also carried the telegraph calls for each station. I go into some station, ask the operator if there's anything around, knowing that there should be. And he'd go over and he'd call somebody on the wire, and I knew who he was calling because the call was there in the, in the timetable. And he'd ask him what time, if, if such and such was by there, and get an answer back. And, before he'd close the key and turn around before he could open his mouth, I'd say, oh, so 908 was by Jonesville at 1022. Well, that ought to be by here in about 20 minutes. <laughs> 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 so it, it, it was fun sometimes. And uh, somebody was talking about uh, the, fr the French uh, fellow there and uh, talking uh, English and how, what did he need water for and so forth. That wasn't French. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I know, but it was. Uh, I thought it was on a French railroad. No, it was on the Korean railroad, the U.S. Army railroad. Well, all right. Korea. Well, all right, so it was Korea. But I thought he was talking French. But anyway, I sp spent my overseas time in Italy uh, with Bob Dole's 10th Mountain Division, by the way. And uh, we went on rest, uh, rest one time down to a town called Montecatini, which at the time was the railhead for that particular area. And coming into town from the south, there were two grade crossings. The first one had gates and a watchman, but the gates didn't work. So somebody had made him a, taken a square piece of cardboard and a stick and made him a sign that had stop on both sides of it. It was 99% of the vehicle traffic was either American or British uh, drivers anyway, so make it in English. The other crossing had gates, but they were operated by wires from a pair of levers at this first crossing. It was interesting to note, some of the crews were GI, some of them were Italian. And the cars were these ones, uh, four-wheel freight cars, and about every third car had a little box on it with a brakeman to operate the hand brakes. Well, the train coming in from down below had a, an Italian crew. They'd come in sight about a half a mile away, and whee! Watchmen would wait till they were about 200 feet from the cross, and they're just crawling along. And then he'd go out there and he'd hold up his stop sign, 
till the train the engine got on the crossing. Then he'd go over and put the gates down on the other crossing. And all these brakemen would hop off as they went by the where he was and go on home. Let the engineer stop the train when it got down into the yard. With GI crew, things did a little differently. They usually came around that curve doing about 40 or 45. Whee! Whee! Whip! Whee! Down would go the gates on the other cross, and this watchman would get back there. I swear he was standing as far back from me, from the track as from me to that back wall there. Holding up, <laughs> holding up that stop sign, waving at anybody that came anywhere near the track. They'd come sailing in over that cross, and they'd still be doing 40 or better. And every brakeman hanging on for dear life, but there wasn't a single one of them dared to wind up on that handbrake till he got that weep indicated set the brakes. <laughs> Oh, it was fun to watch them, believe me, sometimes. Well, since we're talking about overseas operations, I was stationed up at Darud, Iran, on the Iranian State Railway. I was on detached service as a weather observer, but uh, when we went on duty, why, uh, the railroad was just next to, oh, just, uh, oh, about as fast from here out to the parking lot outside, and so I spent quite a lot of time poking around the engine house. This was a crew change point. And uh, when we went for, uh, for a three-day pass, we go north 75 miles to Iraq or south 160-odd miles to Andamesk, and we'd ride the local freight, and we'd see a lot of things. And uh, uh, usually we could ride in the cab, but uh, once in a while we'd uh, ride out in the car with a... Russian guard, uh, somebody like that. They had the little four-wheel cars with the handbrakes on every third or fourth car, and if they had it, as we began to bring over eight-wheel box cars and tankers, why, uh, they began to get some air brakes on there. And when they had 10% air brakes, they thought they were really <laughs> somewhere. And uh, some real interesting experiences that way. But with this is America, and uh, how about telling us about uh, Air Tower when during the World War II, Arnold? Well, as you're probably aware, many of the, most of the, of the uh, operating men on the railroad became part of the operating battalions in the, either the Pacific or the Atlantic Theater. And I had worked with Mort Clark, who was the train director, in air, and he taught me the the uh, CTC, not CTC, but uh, the the automatic uh, switch machines within the tower. So when the time came, they asked me to come in on a spare spare basis, and I came in there for for something like eight years until the not only because the war was over, but, but to be available when a third trick man who was who owned the job and who was famous for tying knots in the cat's tail would screw up the railroad and the train master whom he would call would call me and ask me to go up and straighten it out well this sounds a little bit far-fetched but one particular incident uh, comes to mind that I think would be of uh, interest to all the boys here the world of mirth show was one that went around and spent uh, something like a week or more in a given location putting on these different uh, forms of entertainment. And they were very much like a circus train as far as their equipment is concerned, and they, they had probably uh, 30 cars, including sleeping cars and flat cars and this sort of thing. And in particular would be the big tent which they used for exhibition purposes and that big tent required big poles, which were uh, simply trees which were bigger at one end and then the other. And the word usually was around that the butts of those poles were to be either facing the locomotive or facing the caboose, depending on where they were going to offload. In this particular case, the butts were to be next to the engine. And they came out of Providence, Rhode Island, over the New Haven into Worcester, 
at which point they were supposed to cut those poles off and turn them so that the butts would be next to the engine. It wasn't done, and so the word was around to turn those poles in air and to get out of town just as quick as they could because they were supposed to be in Portsmouth, New Hampshire at 6 the next morning. Well, the first I learned of it was by train master from Fitchburg who called me and said that he didn't know what he'd done, but he'd got that world of mirth tied up in a knot somewhere. Would I go up? Okay, I went up, and believe you me, it doesn't take long to tie up a terminal like air where trains are going in many directions. He had brought that world of mirth train in from Worcester and put it around the West Y and out across the Fitchburg main, both, both mains, until the engineer decided there was something rotten in Amsterdam and stopped and called this man, uh, whose name was Cushing, uh, to tell him what he was doing. Well, they wanted the butts turned. And the, I've forgotten what it was they said the conductor said, but it was uh, not complimentary. <laughs> <laughs> well, there they sat until I got up there, and this is around uh, 12.30 in the morning. I hightailed up there, not very well dressed, but enough. So all I could do then was to tell them to back that whole doggone train back into clear. I protect his rear to back it right back towards Worcester until the engines were in the clear on the Worcester, on the uh, Fitchburg, on the clear of the Fitchburg, but on the WNNP line in the clear. And to sit there until we've got some of those other trains moved because now there's trains coming in all directions, MP4 and, and uh, the Boston trains, MB4, were in the in the uh, offing up there, held by block signals. They couldn't come through. Well, the first thing you do is to get those trains moving. And this man, Cushing, sat there fat, dumb, and happy and let me do it. He never raised a hand. All right. We got that. And incidentally, the State of Maine Express was in behind. It was 81 was in behind them. And we had to get him into town because he had to drop baggage, and in those days, there was military personnel. Get him in, get him out on the Stony Brook heading east, and then to instruct the crew the, of, the, of the circus train to cut those three cars of poles off, go around the west Y and set them off on the main line, go back around, get on the other end of them, and go back onto his train, which is what they in, had intended he should do in the first place. But in the meantime, there's a train master that belonged to this world of mirth, and if ever I'll see another one like it, I'll recognize it because there was none like him here. He had three buck teeth in front. He must have chewed tobacco all his life because they were solid yellow. And he was up in that tower talking to Cushing and to me like a Dutch uncle because that train wasn't going to be in Portsmouth at 6 o'clock, and he had a date with Destiny. But that we, was her name, huh? Well, it wasn't the words he used. He had a vocabulary, and he never repeated himself. But that particular, that particular instance, they uh, moved out. More seriously, uh, we had any number during the war, any number of POW trains, which were temporarily located in Devons until such time as they should be relocated in some other given area. And in one instance that I know about, this train came down into Fitchburg, where they had previously allocated space where that train would stop. And the <laughs> locomotive was up against the home signal, which was at uh, stop. And the minute that train arrived, the place was floodlighted. It previously arranged it. And the only thing that they know is that apparently somebody, some one of those POWs, endeavored to leave the train through the toilet window of one of those coaches. What he couldn't know was that there were men over there with carbines waiting for just such an action. They didn't ask permission, they fired. And there was one or more or less POWs that accompanied that train into air. The uh, word statistically was that in, in air itself, in the 24 hours, there was a movement through that plant somewhere 
every five minutes. And when you consider that you had an east and west uh, main line, Fitchburg, you had the WNP uh, from air to from Worcester to air, you had a double track, Stony Brook taking them to Lowell, and you can see without too much effort that there was uh, a lot going on. The connection that exists today at the Willows where the Stony Brook crosses over onto the Portland didn't exist then. It was all right there within air center under the so-called uh, East Main Street Bridge. And uh, I know that they told us that down on the Stony Brook Railroad itself that they will move down there every 20 minutes in the 24 hours, meaning to say that it wasn't, they didn't wait every 20 minutes. It was all at once and then uh, things would be a lull. But these were, these were things that you did. And people would say to me uh, as a layman, how in the world could you go into a tower like that and be able to operate a s signal system such as that was? And the answer, of course, it was it wasn't me, the man who invented the machine, because it was foolproof. You could not set the signals or switches in such fashion that two trains could come together if the train crews obeyed the signal. You could stop them up here, and stop them back here, and then the only thing you could do was, was to set a release. And as Don can tell you, perhaps he did it. But I did it. And if you've ever heard a clock ticking <laughs> for three minutes or for seven minutes, and there isn't a blessed thing you can do, it's like seeing a fire over here in a building, and you've got to wait seven minutes before you tell somebody that the building is on fire. And it's a weird situation. On the seven minutes deal, I was fortunate in having a maintainer there in the tower who opened the machine up and released that doggone thing so that we could uh, do business. But it was... Uh, that is the longest three minutes or seven minutes <laughs> you ever encountered in your life. <laughs> Everything is quiet, and there's a, you've seen these old Big Ben alarm clocks go tick, 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 tick. Yeah. That's, that's all the sound there is. But until that thing stops ticking and there's a click, you're powerless to do anything. It's, it's got you tied up tight, believe me. But this was something that uh, uh, I don't think I ever enjoyed anymore. I used to do it at night. I worked days for a Worcester company. But during the night, I'd go up there as many as uh, three nights. I, I think I probably worked every, I worked three nights anyway, sometimes four. And uh, just a little interesting wrinkle. I applied for extra gasoline to drive my car to air. And because we had a bus that was carrying the Abbott Worcester passengers to and from Lowell, the man in charge insisted that I didn't need gasoline. And I explained to him that I was doing the same kind of a job as his father-in-law was doing in Lowell. <coughs> Hale Street Tower didn't make any difference. So I said, OK. I've asked for it, you've refused it, I'm going over your head. And the allocation of gasoline in sufficient quantities was awarded to me over this man's protest. And he wasn't man enough to be there in the, in the uh, office to hand me the, the amount of gasoline coupons that I was entitled to at the time. He left the office rather than acknowledge that he was wrong. The thing I remember is going up there, usually in the latter part of June and again in the latter part of August for the camp trains. And you'd oh, get yeah. those going through there. I don't know where they found the motive power or where they found the cars, but you'd have those things going through there, stepping on each other's yellow blocks for two or three hours. Yeah. They got the same thing on the on the uh, Con River. You got yep. trains out, out of Springfield going up to uh, well, Fairley was one place I remember. Yeah. Another, another was up around L up to Littleton. I remember. I can remember. They had him up to CV. Too. Yeah, had him up to CV. I can remember. There was one that always amused the daylights out of me, because the New Haven, when they had a coach assigned to a particular group, would always put a sign in the window of the car for the people that were to be in, in it. And every single year, I'd look out 
proper time of the year, and there would go the car of the Hebrew Hay Fever Relief Association. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, Don speaks of something that this was a North Country institution. Up in, uh, outside of Bethlehem, New Hampshire, which was a great place for the Jewish people to congregate, was actually this hay fever relief association. And apparently the ragweed in August really settled down on them. And they had a separate set of buildings where these people were uh, destined to go. I think they went through to Littleton, or they might have gone to, I don't think they went to Whitefield, I think they went to Littleton and detrained there and were taken over to these buildings. But we knew them as the Hay Fever Relief Association. And those buildings were in there for people who came out of New York City and uh, really suffering from the hay fever that they were subjected to and found great relief because up in there they said, next morning we will breathe again. But those, those camp trains, uh, we had a pilgrimage among railroad enthusiasts every year thanks to the Boston and Maine Railroad who provided us with TNs or transportation notices listing all of these, these trains that came through air at night. And let me tell you, as Don has said, it was a busy place. But one of the experiences that I thought was the funniest was up in Portland, Maine, where the trains arrived to be broken up into different sections to go uh, various points within the state of Maine. There'd be some trains going to up in the Rangeley area. There'd be another set of trains going up on the what they call the back road to, to Danville Junction and up to the Belgrade Lakes. The third section would probably be going to Rockland. And perhaps the fourth section eventually would be made up to go to Main Line to Waterville. And those trains were broken up with switches in both ends of Union Station. When those trains came in, five or six of the trains in a bunch, those cars were all mixed up because they'd come from certain areas like Philadelphia or New York. And those trains were broken up. The Pullmans were, were shifted out and there were eight tracks in Union Station and they made up these necessary trains for the destination to Maine. But what they didn't tell the kids in the camps who were uh, geniuses, they were, they were usually youngsters who came from, from uh, well-attired families, with money. And those kids would get off the train, get the trap door open in their pajamas now, and go across these tracks, never looking to see where the train was going, what was going to happen. None of them ever got run into that we ever heard, but I was there one day with the passenger traffic man in Portland, and these kids would go across the track into the station, into the Armstrong lunchroom, and buy cream cakes and coffee and any manner of uh, sculpt which was forbidden in camp probably, and they knew it, so they were going to have their day. And they'd come out of Union Station, out into the, out into the foyer where the train, in the train shed, with these packages of goodies. And by golly, their car isn't there, the one they left. And where is it? Well, all of a sudden you've got a blubbering kid in your hand. And they don't have any idea where they're going to go, or what they're going to do. But the passenger traffic department was resourceful. They'd been that way before. So they get hold of this kid by the scruff of the neck and grab his pajamas in the back end, in the back end of his cap, which was back of his, uh, the upper part of his pajamas, is a name. Well, this is requirement of all the kids going to camp. They have to have the name in their clothes so that they can be identified. They go to laundry and so forth can be returned. Okay, Camp Walumsek, or whatever it is in the back of his camp. Aha, now you've got a clue. Down through the, through the uh, TNs, and you find Camp Walumsek is up in Aquasuk, up on the Rangeley train. Okay, now you've got a place to go. Get him over into track three, which is the Rangeley train. Give him to the train crew and put him on that train. You might not get him in the right, uh, in the right, uh, car right off the bat, but at least he's in the right direction. And to add insult to injury, the counselors, which are supposed to have been there to keep this thing from happening, are sound asleep because half the night coming up from New York up through, and we used to see it in air going through there, 
these fellows are in the drawing room somewhere with a red hot poker game going. Yeah. <laughs> so that when the time came for the, to be of service, when they got to Portland, they were out of it. But this sort of thing uh, went on for a number of years until uh, they stopped running the those special tr special passenger train. And you you should realize that those sleepers, those Pullman sleepers, were run in advance of the regular exodus 4th of July. They got them into camp before breakfast the next morning, and those cars, now empty, can be returned to New York or Philadelphia or whatever to accommodate the ordinary overflow of passengers who are going, the <coughs> adult passengers who will be going to a resort somewhere else. And the same thing happened at Labor Day. The camps, there's only eight weeks between 4th of July and Labor Day. So that this is the camp season. So if they got them out, got them in there early, then you got them out early, eight weeks, and those kids were accommodated, and it was done with Pullman sleeping cars. And we fellows who stood on the sidelines, uh, I down to Stony Brook more often than not, uh, paying strict attention, and the uh, power would come up through there with uh, usually the best, heaviest power they could uh, provide. Sometimes they were P2 Pacifics, B and M, but more often they were they used either the P5s or the P4s, and an R1. Some of the early R1s were used because, uh, as Don mentioned earlier, they used everything they had. Even once in a while, they might see an I4. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They they weren't partial. Get the best power they had and use it. And they may use a New Haven Pacific or even sometimes one of the main Central's Hudsons would. Show up. Oh, the B and M stole the main central engines, like it was uh, against the law. But uh, that was standard. Well, I remember practice. seeing B and M engines in Bangor too. So sure, but they had to have something. They run a P two up there. <laughs> They'd give them the bottom of the trash barrel. <laughs> well, I want to add a little something to this camp train bit, because we had one several weekends that we came out of New York and had come up through on a Friday night. And this uh, boy was called to flag this extra out of White River Junction up to Bethlehem. And then he was to stay there and come back with it Sunday night. Well, he got up there all right, but when they came back Sunday night, here's the Fitchburg Division brakeman looking for somebody to take the markers off the back end of the train. Cause they were, he's got his own set, he don't need them there. He puts them up, he finally takes them down, leaves them on the platform, puts his up, and gets on board, and away they go back to New York. About three days later, Billy shows up. Where the hell you been, Billy? Oh, it starts with that gal down in New Jersey. <laughs> he checked up with one of the girls in the, in the back compartments of the, the rear Pullman, and he was having a good time when they went through White River Junction, and he went home with her for three days. <laughs> and, and to add another one, of course, they were talking about ball signals. The, the best known ball signal in the B&M was at White River. And I put pretty close to 10 years in attending that. In fact, I was the, the one that pulled the balls down last when everything was cut off. Well, I gave to the society's archives here just this last summer the, a, a copy of the original Concord and Montreal Main Central Bulletin putting the ball signals at Jefferson Junction and yeah. Oh, yeah. and yeah. Coas Junction into service. And I was also going to mention when we were talking about Portland Union Station and the switching that that had a ball signal. Oh, yeah, two, there were, there two. Were a lot of places. There were a lot yeah, of places. one of the yeah. one at each end. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, uh... And of course, so did uh, so did Cumberland Mills at one yep. time. Yep. Oh yeah, Cumberland they, Mills. They had a set at Concord. Yeah. Two, three sets at Concord. They had a set at Concord where one guy sat there and he was pretty near out of coal. Before he got done, he even got the coal boards out and thrown into the gun. <laughs> they keep the fire going. <laughs> yeah. And then they had the fellow that got. Stopped at Bellas Falls on passenger trains. Yeah, I, 
I think probably most of them know. Hung, hung by, by the, the balls and bells falls. <laughs> <laughs> the famous delay report. Yeah. Oh, we had a great time, anyways. How are we doing for time there, Dan? Yeah, about ten minutes. Yeah, all right. Remember the last uh, camp train session we had at AIR when the last year they ran steam? And uh, we were there all night up until, oh, 7.30 about in the morning. And uh, you had a train coming up from Worcester, oh, every 15 or 20 minutes, right on each other's tail. And be a P5 and a P4, and uh, they had two R1s that night. And uh, 13, 30, I mean 41, 13, and 41, 16. And uh, three uh, P4s and uh, two P5s, and uh, then around five in the morning, 4007, the last of the T's came up from Worcester with the freight. The uh, state of Maine had uh, Maine Central diesel on it. So instead of steam, we were a little disappointed in that one. Then around uh, quarter six, there was this heavy whistling coming down from Fitchburg. Dana's trying to guess what the locomotive was by the whistle, and must be a P2, what it turned out to be, an 060 headed for Birka, <laughs> apparently. But we had a good chuckle over that, and he took a little ribbing. I got another good chuckle. You remember the old wire recorders they had for taking sound? Yeah. Well, uh, a fella got one of those, hung on a 700 going up Roxbury Heights, and the 700 had just about all she could pull. And boy, she was really doing some barking. He had a friend in the ticket office in White River Junction Station. So they took that player in there and they set it up. They opened up the CV mic and they started that tape going. They tell me that the dispatchers were running and looking and they couldn't figure out where all that noise was coming from. <laughs> well, I did the same thing with records out of Greenfield. Yeah, yeah. And I had the, the I was play, playing, it, playing it for the benefit of Arthur Howland. It was up there to White River, I don't remember, we was agent, oh, sure. he was t agent, agent, agent for a while. Agent. And I, the original time that it was done, was done for the benefit of the, of the dispatcher at Gardner. But the second time we did it for Arthur's benefit, and this time we timed it right with 491. <laughs> and the guy that was third trick at, at East Northfield, he came in after the train had gone by, said it had been so long since he had handed up orders to a steam engine. He forgot to turn his coat collar up, pull his hat brim down, <laughs> back was full of cinders. And we did it again when they got out of Brattleboro. And we and we did it again as they were approaching Bellows Falls. But of course the engine couldn't, it couldn't go to White River because Arthur was on duty and 491 had diesels. So just before they got to, to uh, Bellas Falls, Alden Champagne was working the third trick in the telegraph office there. He comes in and he says, the diamond man, man uh, no, he says, the, the uh, Rutland dispatcher, he says, they've had trouble with the engine on Rutland 119. He says, they've made arrangements with the CV to borrow that steam engine off of 491. So they go up by the station with the steam engine working and and uh, then pretty soon you hear the steam engine coming back down and going light by the station a couple of times while they switched over onto the Cheshire to go over at the engine house. Meanwhile, 491 disappears. And the next thing you know, we hear 119 getting out of town with this steam engine working like the hell. He's going up by way of Rutland. Poor Arthur. 491 shows up with diesels and the Rutland has made arrangements to deliver that engine back to the 
CV at Essex Junction out of Burlington, so it isn't going to come through White River at all. <laughs> and you know, in later times, I showed Arthur the record that I used that night to play those, and he still wouldn't believe that he hadn't heard a real steam engine. <laughs> Just, just for, just for quick kicks, uh, some of the folks come out uh, to Westford to see me, and of course we're always listening to see if there's a freight train coming, and we try to distinguish whether it's a Conrail, uh, Power, or, or Guilford's second hand. And there'll be a crossing whistle that will come in, and one of the boys, hey, we got to hit the crossing, they're coming. I said, no, that's not. Look, I heard it. Well, he heard it all right, but what he, what he doesn't know is that Fletcher's Quarry over on Route 40 still have their diesel, and they blow the whistle conventional two long, one short, and one long for that crossing on Route 40, Groton Road in Westford, even though there's no hope of their ever coming down to the B&M track at all. That's just a little diversion from... Uh, yeah. from uh, uh, entertaining somebody who is willing to listen, I guess. There's, uh, there's a lot of people don't realize that that engine is still there and, st and still in use. <clears throat> well, I used to uh, have a crack at those uh, Fletcher engines. Uh, my father-in-law was a second-class steam engineer and uh, when they had two locomotives running, he had the uh, older engine down at the new mill, and he used to go down to Brookside and pick up the cars for the quarry for shipping granite out. And uh, on every 4th of July weekend, a holiday, why I'd spend a day riding with him. And uh, they claimed they did two or three days' work in one day because I was aboard. He was trying to discourage me from being interested in railroads, but... Uh, it only whetted my appetite. I got to uh, drive the 273, the uh, 287, and the 410. And I was there the last day of the 444. Mm. It was a sad sight to see that pull in, and then they dumped the file. Let it just let her walked away from it, and she never ran again under power. I never did get over there while they had the steam, okay. unfortunately. Well, Dan, you're showing there that we're getting close. My watch says it's close to 9 o'clock. So we will thank you all for coming. We hope we've entertained you. And uh, we've had a lot of fun doing it. All right. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, I've had a lot of requests to have a meeting like this, and I hope uh, maybe you'll come back again, perhaps in a year or so, we could do it again. I'd like to thank Danny Hyde and John Goodwin and John Allen Roderick, who also helped me put this together, and thank you all for coming. What we thank probably you. should do is to pick a subject or yes. whatever it would be that would be of interest and uh, have some notes prepared that something we could uh, follow up. All right, that's this has been off the top of our head.